I am Elle Penelope, author of Epic Fantasy and Paranormal Romance, and welcome to My Imaginary Friends, a look behind the scenes of an author mapping the worlds in my head and making them a reality. Hello, friends. Today is Friday, May 22nd, 2020, and this is episode 69 of My Imaginary Friends. I'm Leslie. So this week's best thing is that I watched the entire first season of The Expanse. Now, people have been telling me to watch the show probably since it first came up, and um, I just don't watch a lot of television. But I finally sat down to watch it because it had been on my mind for a few months, and um, I loved it. I actually got my husband to watch the first five episodes, and then he bowed out because he just said it was a little too slow. He didn't actually dislike it, but um, he has a short attention span. Uh, he has undiagnosed ADD, and uh, it's hard for him, so... I, I get it. it. It does. It's not the fastest paced show ever, but the character work is so glorious and the world building. He loved the world building um, and I loved it too. And But really for me, it was the characters. I love it when you have these dilemmas where you do the right thing and it, and it turns out to be the wrong thing. I don't think I write that ever, but it's really inspired me to think more about that. But I, I just love that in these layered characters and all of the different relationships and I'm eager to get on to the second season. Also with the character development, what I was talking about last week with that movie Code 8 where they bungled the character development with this season, um, they did, they had not quite similar, but they had this character and, and they established his morality very clearly and his, um, you know, his line in the sand, the thing he's not going to cross. And it gets to a point where, um, I think it's either the last episode or the second to last, I'm not going to spoil it, but he's faced with, you know, something that he could do that the audience would believe is justified. Nobody would fault him for this, but it would cross that line and he doesn't cross it. And I think that is so great. And I can imagine the show pushing him at some point to cross the line. I think, I think we might have to go there, but, uh, it's just an example of doing that character work really well and carefully and, and well thought out along with all the other details that are just so great about that show. And I'm so excited to be watching it. It's very, very inspiring. In my writing update, I have, um, okay, so I had to bail on the 20K in five days challenge as much as it pained me and it really does pain me to bail on a challenge, but it just wasn't right for what I'm doing. And it was going to be detrimental to actually the point of it, which was to get this book written. Like I said last week, I just, I'm not in a fast drafting place. I've been talking a few weeks, uh, for a few weeks about this book and thinking I was going to have to, you know, throw away everything and start from scratch completely, which is, I think the mindset I was coming to when I started doing the 20K in five days challenge. And then I read it and I realized, well, I can keep some of the setups. I'm moving a lot of things around and I can keep pieces of it. So when I'm trying to fast draft and I know somewhere in that 50,000 words that I wrote a year and a half ago is the description of this place and uh, the physical descri description of a character or something about just these details. And yes, I can skip it. I can move forward and just write the scene and know that I can go back and drop in those details. But at a certain point, it's like the vibe is off. I don't know a better way to describe it than that. Um, when I'm writing, and especially when I'm fast drafting, it's sort of like a flow. And it's hard to do if I've already established these scenes and I'm in more of a revision mode, even if the revision is mostly new words. So I'm calling it a revision, but I'm in like a 1600 word scene, I might only use 100 old words. But it's just feeling much better to to do it as a revision. Because even when I fast draft, my revisions are basically a right from scratch anyway, but they're not done fast. <laughs> they're, they're slow drafts. It's like just more normal writing. Um, and I really still believe in fast drafts. But in this case, I already had one, you know, and even though I'm changing 90% of it, of the words, like 90% of the words are being, are different. The energy of the scene and all of the locations were set. So the new process for this is just to approach each scene and um, as a slow draft 
And then I open up the old documents and I'm pulling descriptions and places and some and dialogue, you know, a line here or there and then changing it with the new character motivation and background and everything that colors the dialogue and colors the POV and everything else. But it's working much better. My goal is 15,000 words a week. So because I did fast draft some of the new stuff, I got to 18,000 words last week. If I can if I can get 15,000 words a week, then I should be able to finish this by the end of June. And that is my goal. And it's clean words. It's clean that like at the end of this, I should be able to send it off to someone to read and it not be a mess. But yeah, this is definitely the more focused, fine-tuned writing. And it's it's draining, it's slower. I'm only getting, you know, max 2,000 words in like two or three hours. Um, but that's how it works for me when I'm doing a more polished draft. So I'm, it's feeling good. Um, and it's always, it's always hilarious to me how much I, I work on the plotting and then... <laughs> I'm not going to say I ignore it because it's in my head and those things end up happening. But all of the new things that I discover as I'm writing are are really great. And sometimes they match up with the plotting and sometimes they're going to go conflict with the plotting. Um, so I think the mantra is just be flexible with your process. Uh, so I'm, I'm flexible enough to know that I, I couldn't continue that challenge the way I wanted to. And I had to shift gears into something that felt right and was more appropriate for the stage. And that I was wrong about some things, you know, and figure that out and then uh, move forward with something that I hope is right. And if that turns out to be wrong, then, you know, keep keep it going. So that is the moral of the story. I also wanted to give a shout out to Alexis Daria, who is a fantastic author and I love her books. And... Um, she said that something in the podcast sparked something for her and she went down a path with a character and um, just got to where she needed to be. And I'm just, I was so happy to hear it. And uh, she has a new book coming out that I'm super excited about, which is You Had Me at Ola. Amazing cover. Props to Alexis. And um, if you haven't read her stuff, definitely go read Contemporary Romance. It's wonderful. In RWA News, they announced that they are retiring the Rita uh, award, of which Alexis is also a recipient, and they are starting a new award called the Vivian, named after Vivian Stevens, who was one of the founders of RWA, who is also a black woman. So as with anything RWA related, there was some controversy about the announcement. A lot of people I saw were really excited and happy about it, but there were some people who um, a little bit more cynical about it, uh, who called it performative and said that things like it you know, doesn't address all of the issues and sort of just slapping a new name on the award is not going to fix things. I tend to be in the optimist camp. I think that when things aren't working and you start from the ground up to build something else that's new, that's probably the best way to do it. Like they had been trying to put band-aids on the Rita for a while and improve things. Uh, but now saying that we are turning the page, we are starting with something brand new that from the ground up will be focused on, um, equity, inclusion, fairness, uh, all of those things that we wanted to see in the readers that um, when you start from the beginning with those as foundational aspects, I think you're going to get further than trying to patch them on after three decades where they weren't priorities. So I'm optimistic. I think that the criticism that it's performative in terms of naming it after Vivian Stevens, I can see that point. But at the, at, on the other hand, I don't have a problem with it. I think that the reasoning is valid. I think Vivian Stevens has been erased from RWA history and has not been in the conversation as much as she should have been. And so honoring her with this award makes a lot of sense. And it is a black woman and it's sort of saying, this is what we stand for now. And if you want to call that a performance, maybe but it's also a declaration i think and it's a declaration of intent and you know this is how we mean to move forward so i think it's it's a good sign so i don't know if i'm going to enter the vivian or not um i guess we'll see what how that how that pans out because i still don't care a whole lot but i i i support the idea and i support the the forward momentum and the people who are actually in the trenches doing the work and uh yeah, so we'll see. 
And today I have a very rare interview. It's my second ever, because I did not want this to be an inter interview podcast. But I think the chance to talk to interesting people about things that are that I don't know about or that are very different from how I do things is one that I would like to embrace from time to time. And since I am a consummate plotter, and I talk about that a lot, and planning, and you know, you hear all this from me all the time, I thought it would be great to talk to Jeffy Kennedy about not plotting and how she approaches things, and just to get a different perspective, because obviously the way I do things is not either the right way or the only way for anyone to do things. I just hope that by sharing my journey that someone can either pick up something, spark an idea for them and their own process and journey. And so I would like to welcome Jeffy Kennedy on to talk about her new book and her approach as a pantser, um, even though I know she doesn't like the term. Okay. So welcome to my imaginary friends, Jeffy. Thank you. I'm very excited. Am, am I a real friend or an imaginary friend? You are both. <laughs> sometimes I talk to you in my head on the show and now I get to talk to you in real life. <laughs> I know. I know. Our, our non-simultaneous conversation is now simultaneous. Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> So I wanted to ask you, you have a brand new book coming out, The Fiery Crown, with a beautiful poster behind you for those of you who yes. are on the video. <laughs> and um, you talk a lot on your podcast, which is First Cup of Coffee with Jeffy Kennedy, for those who are unaware. I highly recommend it. Uh, and you talk about being a plot gardener, sometimes called a pantser. And it's really interesting to me as a, as a heavy plotter to, um, you know, to hear about your process and the fact that you're able to do such wonderful world building. And I really just wanted to talk to you about how that works for you. So when you first get an idea, um, like kind of talk us through just what comes first. Is it the characters? Or is it the world? How do things emerge in your brain? It's always the characters. And in fact, I'm starting, I just started a new thing this morning. And so I always start with the character, um, almost always with the heroine. I'm not sure I've ever started with the guy first. Mm -hmm. um, but I start with her and her situation. I always have a feel for like her emotional predicament. And then I know what kind of what is causing that, what about her world is putting her in this predicament. Mm -hmm. And then I just start building it out from there. Then when does the world come in, the actual country and the politics and all of that stuff? So it's kind of changed for me over time. Um, but it's the heart of it is still that I ride around in my characters' heads and discover things as I witness it through them. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm often surprised by things because, you know, like once they go out and start walking around and they run into other people and people say things to them or they see things, I'm like, oh, I didn't know that was in the world. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's hard for me to explain it in some ways because I think I'm a very intuitive writer in a way and I decouple a whole lot of it from my more analytical thinking side so so it is kind of like dreaming up the story in a way and just letting that the world sort of show itself to me okay. now that said now that i'm at the point where you know like i talk to my agent sarah about ideas mm -hmm. and we talk about like what's would work you know like what she thinks she could sell and whatnot and that sort of thing i end up having to think about the world a little bit more ahead of time than i used to and it's really an acquired skill i i am a gardener or i write for discovery because i'm simply not able to figure out what the story is until i actually write it mm -hmm. um i think it sounds really cool that you guys can do that <laughs> it's, well it's part, like part of it is I, I do all this work ahead of time, but I'm still discovering things with every scene and things are still, un, you know, um, unveiling themselves to me. So even with plotting, like as much as I plot, I spend weeks plotting, it's still a lot of things change and I, I don't know everything. I don't think it's possible to know everything until you write it. No, it's just I like mean, levels. Like even um, my friend Dorinda Jones, who is, you know, an obsessive pre-plotter, you know, like she spends months and ends up with like a hundred page outline <laughs> that includes dialogue and snippets of scenes and all that. She still finds herself discovering things as she writes it. So yeah. I think we're all like sort of on, this, on a spectrum. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, and so I'm able to sort of look ahead a little bit and at least come up with some, maybe I use more of that analytical self to kind of figure out like what the world will be, but then sometimes I end up changing it as I write because okay. one thing I found, and I've been kind of writing a couple of articles about this lately, but you know, like, and I don't know if you find this, but I find that like on my first pass, my first attempt at the world, I tend to pull in a whole lot of my program stuff, mm -hmm. a lot of my knee jerk assumptions and, you know, preconceived notions and all of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm, when I'm fine tuning it, I have to go in and question my own assumptions and say, well, did you put this in here just because this is like fantasy trope number yeah. 146? <laughs> That happens to me too. That's why I, I like the fast drafting method because I get out my first inclination. And then when I go back into the, in the revision, it's like, yeah, I'm questioning everything. I'm like, oh, is that a stereotype? Is that, like you said, just a cliche? What, what I, your first idea is rarely the best idea, you know, so right. then I get to dig deeper in the revision process and find something that's actually original and interesting to say. And weren't you the one you were talking about on your podcast that like when you were a baby writer, because you'd only ever read fantasy books with like white people in them that you were like writing white characters and you had to go in and change that? Yes. Yeah. I, I find that fascinating. I mean, it's like, God, you know, we all just get so, you know, from those books we read as kids, we just mm -hmm. get this idea in our heads and we really have to work to shake that up. Yeah. And that's across the board. I mean, and, and even now, like I consciously work at it, but sometimes the character just for some reason is white. And like you watch, you watch so much TV and movies and, and I'm like, no, I don't want to write. I don't feel like I need to be writing white characters personally. I feel like there's plenty of people doing that and right. the world doesn't need that from me. So. <laughs> well, yeah. Does, you know, and I, I do that with, um, I, I have had a few men ask me if I'm ever going to have a man like who's like in power and a good person and you know this sort of thing or you know like who's who's more in charge of the story than the heroine I'm like why I mean the if you want that those books are out there <laughs> yeah exactly like yeah they don't need to go to you for that <laughs> no no don't go to me for that because you won't get it <laughs> <laughs> so as far as time period is that another thing that just the characters show you because you write a lot of medieval-esque fantasy as far as I that I've read Yes, it's true. And I'm, I'm trying to get away from that. Um, the Forgotten Empires trilogy, I deliberately moved up to being more of a, um, like, on the verge of industrial revolution type society, because mm -hmm. they've discovered this sort of powerful substance that can be used as an explosive weapon, but they're also beginning to use it for, like, motors and that okay. sort of thing, which comes up more in The Fiery Crown and the third book, The Promised Queen. And part of that comes from, I was on this panel um, a couple years back on like why so much fantasy takes place in a medieval-esque mm -hmm. environment. You know, like, are we recreating fairy tales? Are we all still sort of enslaved Tolkien's vision? Right. Um, you know, and there's this whole idea that magic doesn't coexist with technology. Mm -hmm. and, it, and is that real? Is that a real tension or is that again something that we've just sort of gotten programmed? So like with this new thing that I started writing, I, I need to figure out a way, there's going to be magic, but I need to figure out what kind of tech I want it to be because yeah, I don't want to be just reiterating this mm -hmm. medieval-esque, we have swords and spears. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love like the mix of technology and magic. And I think it's just because you don't see it as often and it gives you other things to play with. It gives you other options and you can travel places more quickly and that just can change a story in and of itself where you don't have to worry about horse travel and you know, how are they getting from point A to point B. <laughs> Right, right. And, and most of us um, end up glossing the horses so yes. much, you know, like the accusation that we treat them like basically hay burning cars <laughs> is, is a valid one because nobody wants to deal with how difficult it really is to mm -hmm. deal with horses and keep a horse alive on a long trip yeah <laughs> it, it yeah i mean it's um you can spend your whole fantasy novel on dealing with horses and 
not get much else done. So with conflict, like I know that one of the things I had to teach myself when I was t- learning how to write a novel was conflict, because I think a lot of early writers have this issue where they want to be nice to their characters and they're uncomfortable with conflict. So does that just, is that not another thing that just kind of comes to you or do you spend time um, creating or thinking about the forces of antagonism and how, that, how that's going to play out in the books? It's an interesting question. Um, I always feel like I don't have as much action in my books as I should. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm not a fan of violence, um, which sounds like a weird thing to say now that it came out of my mouth. But, <laughs> you know, as opposed to all the people who are. Um, yeah. no, I mean, I don't, I don't like writing fight scenes. I don't like gore and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. I was telling a friend of mine just yesterday that I've never quite gotten the zombie thing. I don't understand <laughs> why people like zombies. And she said, oh, well, zombies are a reason to have blood and gore and violence with no guilt because, mm-hmm. yeah. they're, you know, and I was like, oh, well, no wonder I don't like it because I, I don't like violence without consequences. Right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, as far as emotional conflict, I think I'm much better at that. And some of that's me coming out of the, you know, my love of romance Mm -hmm. is that I like setting up that initial tension between, I almost always write hero and heroine. I think I always have. um, Yeah, I have a couple of characters who are bi or pan, but um, I haven't done a relationship other than that because I'm very... I'm very cishet, and so I'm nervous about attempting another kind of relationship because I'm not sure. sure I would do it right. right. I like doing that emotional conflict mm-hmm. in the love relationship, but then when it comes to external conflicts and fighting injustice or the bad people, I usually have to be very deliberate about adding it in. Mm-hmm. Um, I have learned how to do better at fight scenes and battle scenes because I was getting a lot of feedback for a while where people were like, you know, you kind of whipped out on this fight <laughs> scene. And I'm like, I know, because it's boring and I hate fight scenes. I'm exactly the same way. Yes. Are you? I don't oh. like writing fight scenes. I skim them. And then my brother's always like, we need more from the fight scene. And I'm like, but I'm not interested in the fight scene. That's the least yes. interesting part. Yeah. The, all I care about in the fight scene is like, what kind of injuries they come away with and who wins. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, it reads that way. But so here's what I've learned how to do. And and you might do better at this because you're already, you have a multi-pass process. But I have learned to just go ahead and like write my fight scene, write my battle scene in the most bare bone ways as I write the book and get it through, get, you know, figure out who wins and who, what kind of injuries they come out with. And then... I go back on multiple passes and just layer in more stuff to the fight and to the battle and add more details. And if I do it in little doses like that, Mm -hmm. I don't get quite so annoyed with it. Okay, so for this trilogy, um, the magic systems, that's what I wanted to ask you about. How how does the magic evolve when you're writing, uh, especially like a new series like this? Again, it's pretty intuitive. I'm not nearly as analytical about it as you are, where you set up all of your rules and 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 where you're judgy about other shows. Yeah. <laughs> Witcher. I know, right? <laughs> oh, can't even talk about The Witcher. <laughs> I loved The Witcher. Really? Yes. I was compelled by it. Like I watched every episode, even when I had no idea what was happening and was bothering me. So there was something about it that draws you in, but, and I'll probably watch the second season whenever it comes out, but like, ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, some things will really bother me with logic, but apparently that's not one of them. Um, so my magic systems kind of come out of personal philosophy, kind of come out of, well, you're interested in mastermind stuff. So a lot of my magic comes from the idea of, of manifesting what you think, mm-hmm. of you know putting uh, what you think and what you envision out in the world and having it become true. So I would say that's a core theme of all of my magic systems. Um, then once my different series and different worlds, I have to make deliberate choices to again, differentiate the magic systems, especially, I mean, for really prosaic reasons like non-competes. 
Uh, in my contracts, I have to make sure that it's really not the same thing. Right. Um, so for this series, uh, I knew that the magic was going to be land-based and nature-based because I wanted that to be in opposition to the emperor who is um, the antithesis of that, mm -hmm. I guess, someone mm -hmm. who does not care for the land. And I've always been very interested in the, you know, the old Celtic ideas of the king being married to the land and um, sacri the, the king being sacrificed to feed the land or the queen and, and how those things are tied together and, and a lot of the Celtic ideas of, um, of deities being embedded in nature and being embodiments of nature. But, um, I do actually approach my magic in a similar way. I think it comes out of growing up as a Christian scientist, which is a very metaphysical I didn't uh, know religion. That. Yeah. Uh -huh. And everything is about, you know, mind over matter, which is what most people call it. We don't call it that, but I'm not practicing anymore, but that's kind of the, the basis of my entire worldview. And so it, it ends up in the magic systems a lot, which I think is really interesting that you do a similar type of thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, to me, and, and possibly to you, you know, that's, that's part of our core belief system, you know, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, as you believe, so is your world. Right. And yeah, and I think that's just um, one of the best descriptions I ever heard of your voice, of discovering or refining what your voice is as a writer, is that it comes out of your beliefs. Mm. And and that as long as you are authentic to your personal beliefs, your voice will be authentic. And so. That's great. Yeah. That's actually really interesting. It voice is, is sort of hard to pin down, you know, like. it is, it is. Yeah. And, um, you, and you know, who said that was, uh, Jane Ann Krentz and Susan Elizabeth Phillips at RWA. They often do this kind of, um, cause they've been best friends for their entire oh, careers and writing partners. Yeah. I mean, they exchange work and wow. have known each other for like 40 years. <laughs> and so they will do like this tag team, um, secrets of, of the best selling sisterhood. That's what they call it. <laughs> and they, and they change it up every year. They add new stuff to it and it's, it's fascinating, but that was something that they talked about. Because it's hard for new writers to figure out what voice is. And sometimes for readers, too. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, readers will come back for an author's voice, but they don't always um, know what it is mm -hmm. that they are, that they're yeah. liking. Right. It's very hard to articulate. And I get questions about that from newer writers, just wondering about voice. And it, it is hard to even know what to say. It's, it's sort of just like, trust yourself. And, and don't try, don't think about it too much because it's going to come through no matter what. Yeah. Last question, I think, as on romance, since you are a fantasy romance author, or how would you describe it? Is that how you put it? Yeah, I mean, Forgotten Empires is called romantic fantasy, okay. but I, I don't know how they're deciding which it is. <laughs> right. There is apparently a difference for some people, but I think the difference changes depending on who you are. It does. Considerations, I guess, in terms of creating the romance. So you, you said you start with the heroine generally, with the idea and, and the tension. Where does the romantic conflict come into that? And uh, the whole journey of the romance, especially in like a trilogy like this one, where I'm, I'm guessing it's going to take, it's more than one book over the, where this romance is, is growing. Right. And it was one reason why I was really excited to take the deal with St. Martin's, because I did have offers from other publishers, but they wanted more of the standard romance setup of a different hero, hero heroine for uh, each book. Yeah. And, and I really wanted the opportunity, especially with these two, because I felt like they had a, a long journey ahead of them. Mm -hmm. I, I really wanted the chance to, to explore that over three books and have them come together. So, so yeah, I generally think if I start with the heroine, uh, then almost, you know, and, and kind of like, what, what about her world is making her life difficult? Then the next thing I think about is like, who would be the, the perfect guy to help her move forward, but who would also drive her absolutely crazy? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and what would his qualities be? Um, because I really do, one of the things I love about romance comes back to that idea of personal transformation. It's about 
having to give up old ideas of yourself and become somebody new in order to find love, in order to find that kind of self-fulfillment that allows you to transform and um, self-actualize, if you want to talk about it that way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, usually I'm looking at what kind of person does she really need that's going to challenge everything she already thinks about herself and make her have to grow and become the person she actually wants to be. Mm. And do you think about it from the hero's perspective also, his growth arc? Sometimes yes and sometimes no. It depends on the book. Mm -hmm. um, but And sometimes it's like pretty much all about the hero and and not the heroine, although it's still pretty much her story. I mean, as far as like that having to change and grow. Right. But um, yeah, ideally, if I can make it dovetail so that so that they're coming against each other like that. And that was one reason why I really like Khan and Leah in this trilogy, is I feel like they both are being held back by a lot of ideas that shaped their childhood and their growing up. And, and they both have very fierce needs that are kind of um, at loggerheads from time to time. But really what they need to do is figure out how to work together mm -hmm. in order to achieve what they need to. So in this case, I think it's both of them having to change. Right. Well, thank you so much. It's been well, really great talking you. to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fire Crown, it comes out, which date? May, May 26th. May 26th. The Fiery Crown is out tomorrow if you're listening to this on the day this podcast drops. And if you haven't read The Orchid Throne, definitely go back and read that first. I talked about liking that book so much after I first read it. So thanks, Steffi, for being on the show. And I hope that you enjoyed the interview. I don't know how often I'll do interviews. I still don't want that to be the focus of the podcast. But every once in a while, I think it might be nice to do. So my goals for this week are to get my 15,000 words. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I have seen the cover of Requiem of Silence and my jaw dropped. It is perfection. I am so excited about this cover, y'all. I'm so serious. I don't know when the cover reveal is going to be. I mean, you'll definitely be seeing it, but like my jaw dropped. So happy. Oof. All right. So I hope that you have a wonderful week and that it is filled with wonderful things. And until next week, happy reading. For episode show notes and to sign up for the Footnotes newsletter, go to myimaginaryfriendsshow.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and watch the video episodes on YouTube. Leave a rating and review to help this to help support the show. And My Imaginary Friends is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. For more fantastic podcasts, go to frolic.media slash podcasts. <laughs> <laughs>